folks, Paul Roberts here, um, back again with another video. Uh, I know it's been a few weeks. I'm spending the majority of my time into the documentary filming. Um, I've collected a bunch of really awesome footage uh, for my next documentary, which is on the development of largemouth bass, essentially from egg to super predator. Uh, I've also been collecting footage to add to the spawn documentary you've probably seen uh, I put up pretty much as a trial balloon so my videos are not going to be coming out on a daily basis I'd like to shoot for a weekly basis but uh, that's tough to do I've got uh, a lot on my plate inside and outside of my uh, video production efforts um, and I'm, I'm aiming for quality over quantity in this channel so uh, I, I hope that works for all of us Okay, up next here, um, I want to talk about uh, something important, something really important, and that is fishing line. It's, been, it's something that I've been wanting to get to for some time now, for quite a, a while now. Um, uh, I, I can scarcely talk about fishing and presentation stuff without first covering fishing line. It's that important. Now, this subject could cover some serious real estate. So what I want to do in this video is focus on how line contributes to what I consider the most challenging and interesting part of our fishing uh, presentation, that is getting fish to bite. <laughs> oh, he chased it. That was fun. Oh yeah, that's a good fish. I long ago came to the conclusion that fishing line is the most important piece of tackle we own uh, in terms of presentation. Before I do a video or videos on presentation, which I'm dying to do, uh, I need to address fishing line because it really is critical to uh, actually inseparable from effective presentations. Some could argue that lures or hooks or rods are the critical piece, um, and, and it's true, all are important. But the fact is that awesome lure we've been dying to try, uh, not to mention that awesome top-of-the-line rod we saved for, are destined to be chained to a long leash. Line is an inseparable part of the lure. Like it or not, they come together. Uh, we're not presenting a lure, but a lure and line combination. Um, and it's here in the line that a good chunk of our presentation challenges actually lie. Between that awesome rod and that awesome lure lies a truly formidable barrier to inciting fish to bite. Water. Water is a thick, viscous, even gelatinous substance that our lines must negotiate. Uh, I've long argued that the greatest breakthrough in angling will come when we can do away with that pesky line altogether, uh, that long string of molecules that lies between us and that lure. If you've got any ideas, I'm all ears. Uh, whatever it is, it'll revolu revolutionize angling. In the meantime, uh, let's look at this most critical link in the chain between uh, us and, and those fish. Contrary to what you may read and what a lot of people seem to believe, how our line affects our presentations has little to do with how well fish can see fishing lines. Research has shown that bass can physically see lines of all diameters when trained by a food reward to do so. Um, assuredly, untrained bass can see lines too. They just don't know what lines represent. It's an out of mind, out of sight sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, fish can perceive our lines and may be put off or even spooked by them. But it's not because it's a, a fishing line, okay? Uh, there are plenty of line-shaped objects out there in the wild. Instead, the issue lies in whether our lure is perceived as we would hope, as food, okay? Um, or, or even what we often must settle for, <laughs> and that's a prey-sized object that moves in a tantalizing manner close enough to a fish that's in an appropriate mood. <laughs> okay, this last sentence actually says quite a lot. Um, things we've actually been exploring and will continue to explore in greater depth um, in, in this Nature of Fishing channel. Presentation is about trying to fool fish into thinking our lure is a food item. Um, seems simple enough, and fish want to eat. So what's the problem? 
The problem is the fish's brain has a lot to say in this matter. Uh, and that pea-sized brain that people like to describe fish brains as is really quite a bit more sophisticated than many of us probably realize. A fish brain, its central processing center, deciphers incoming sensory stimuli and either gives the fish the go-ahead to strike or cautions it to slam on the brakes. What fish perceive and identify as food is a much larger subject, um, and that's one we'll address in my future documentary uh, a couple down the road here on hunting and feeding behavior of, of adult bass. Uh, for our purposes here, I'll say this, that fish exhibit two primary, most basic responses to outside stimuli. Uh, let's say a splash or, or a movement nearby. One response is a positive investigative one. Uh, the flip side is a negative or inhibitory one. Every angler figures this out for themselves with experience over time. Uh, essentially, everybody coins the same phrase, um, spook them and the game's over. You know, all our expensive high-tech gear instantly becomes moot at that point. Uh, talk about spitting into the wind. What many anglers may not realize is how deeply wired and easily tripped the negative inhibitory side of this equation um, is compared with that positive investigative one. There are more reasons to say no than go when it comes to chasing prey. Uh, for one thing, chasing prey is enormously costly, energetically speaking, um, and the attentional focus and physical motion required in the pursuit of prey puts that predator at risk of drawing the attention of even larger predators to itself. Uh, so pursuing prey has a dangerous flip side, exposing the hunter to being hunted itself. And this is an age-old problem. It's why it's so deeply wired. It works this way. Unidentified objects, especially those deemed large enough to be potentially dangerous, trigger that deeply wired negative response. Uh, there are sections of the brain that are actually dedicated to the perception and subsequent response to what are called looming objects, objects that might potentially eat you. That response has become, over time, an automatic one. Uh, especially and robustly wired in uh, a bolt first and ask, ask questions later type of response. Delay and you're not likely to pass on your genes. The result for our purposes here is that fish have two main responses to an object in close proximity in their environment. Is it something to eat or is it something that might eat me? Both are default expectations, both being so critically important to survival. Okay, where do fishing lines enter in? Fishing lines become significant to fish when they trigger that negative response. Uh, in the positive response, the one that suggests to the fish that the lure is indeed food, the line isn't even in the picture. Uh, again, out of mind, out of sight. They don't know what line is or associate it with uh, that apparent prey item. However, the thicker the line is, the greater its diameter, the larger the object you're putting in the water near your fish. That line landing on the water during the cast, um, cutting um, and moving water as you retrieve, um, even merely twitching that line when you bring it under tension for strike detection or to start your retrieve can make fish suddenly aware that there is a large unidentified object in the immediate area. Uh, their responses vary along an axis, like so many things biological, uh, and these are tied to um, who's doing the viewing, the type of fish, and the conditions and circumstances present at that moment. Conditions and circumstances, C and C, is something that's going to be a broken record on this channel. Uh, uh, they make or break the fish's day and therefore your day. Different fish species respond in different ways, depending on their sensory strengths. Catfish, uh, carp, and other minnows are highly auditory. Um, and years ago, I came to believe that carp could hear a line, uh, what I called sing, in the water. Um, they alarming to line movements beyond their sight. Um, line cutting the water um, uh, sent something that they could pick up uh, uh, and, and really spook them from a distance. 
Uh, bass are primarily visual responders, and I've never seen them appear to respond to line si singing in the same way, um, although a loud sound nearby can certainly alarm them. Sky and water conditions play a big role in how fish respond accordingly. Under bright sunny skies and clear calm water surface, uh, conditions of high visibility for the fish and for their predators, those fish are often on the very edge of high alert. Under such conditions, an assumption of danger becomes the default response to uh, any, almost any nearby disturbance. But on the flip side, under darker reduced visibility conditions, uh, the same stimulus is more apt to elicit um, the investigative response. Um, it, it's, it's one of the reasons bass and many other uh, predators are uh, uh, crepuscular or low light hunters. Um, they have advantages there. Um, uh, actually, in fact, under dark reduced visibility conditions, I've found that bass are apt to rush over to investigate the lure splashdown instead of spooking. Uh, they may strike a lure right at splashdown, um, even chase the lure as it's you know, flying through the air on the cast. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons, it's the primary reason why uh, the old advice of when you're fishing a topwater lure is to cast out, when it lands, wait. And they say, let the rings subside. Well, you can wait different amounts of time. But what's happening is that splash can be attractive. And it takes a little bit of time for a fish to get there, depending on the conditions. Um, to contrast that, under bright high visibility conditions um, on the very same water body even, the lure flying through the air, the line flashing in the sun, um, uh, and the lure or even the line landing on the water can turn those fish inside out. The result on such uh, high visibility days is that each cast can be a fish spooker. The, the action of the casting and retrieving uh, can put every fish down between me and splashdown. This is one of the main reasons behind why experienced anglers often suggest that under bright bluebird conditions we fish heavy cover or we fish deeper um, or we go to uh, and often along with um, fishing deeper fish finesse tackle with small lures and light lines. We're trying to minimize the, the uh, spooking that, that happens under those conditions. Uh, this also explains the fly fisher's nemesis, the trout fly fishers in particular, um, but, but bluegills too, believe it or not. Um, it's called drag. When the leader puts tension, often even very slight tension, on the fly, um, uh, especially noticeable on the surface, uh, which causes the fish to reject even the most carefully chosen fly. Most fly fishers, unable to put a finger on exactly why, will say, well, drag makes the fly look uh, unnatural. What that unnatural look is and why it will either cause a rejection, uh, uh, put the fish down, make them sulk, or, or scare them outright, is because they suddenly have become aware that something unexpectedly much larger is looming in close proximity. And, and that's the line. It could even be three inches of leader on very flat water and, and high visibility conditions. In the case of the the carefully chosen fly meant to mimic exactly what the trout had been eating, the lure and line suddenly meld together and appear to be too large an object. The fish then rejects the lure as not food um, and may even just bolt for cover. A fish's previous experience with predators and anglers um, plays a role in how a given fish will respond to your attempts at feeding them. Uh, a fish recently spooked is more likely to react negatively, and fish with experience with angling um, in general are known to be more discerning than naive fish. Uh, lastly, some individual fish are inherently, in fact genetically, it's been found, more susceptible to being alarmed um, than our other individuals. Uh, some are bolder, some are shyer. Um, it's an, it's a, called a, a personality trait. The take home here is that a major problem with using too coarse or too thick a line is that that length of line can more easily register with the fish. It could either be sensed separate from or as part of the lure. Um, either way, the fish becomes aware of an unidentified large object that's just too close for comfort um, and, and they respond accordingly. A line immersed in water, again a thick gelatinous substance, is acted upon across its entire length. 
The important factor here is the total surface area exposed to that, that gelatin. The thicker the line and the more of the line you have out, the more surface area of line is affected by the water. These effects counteract the weight, buoyancy, and action of the lure. Uh, again, uh, we're talking depth and speed control and lure action. Uh, not to mention the effects on hook setting and fish fighting effectiveness. You should realize, um, though, that lines um, being sold in, in terms of break strength can lead you astray because line break ratings are marketing categories, essentially, and may not match the line diameters across different line formulas. Uh, in the next video on choosing fishing lines, uh, we'll look into this in, in some depth. Uh, it's a very important thing to be aware of. Um, I buy my lines based on diameter, not break strength. Okay, let's get uh, a little more specific here um, and talk about matching a line diameter to, to our lures. Although all lures are affected in similar ways, we're going to use a jig in our illustrations here. Jigs consist of a simple weight and buoyant body that well illustrate the basic effects of line on our presentations. Um, because of this, they also may be the single best way to learn those fundamental controls in lure presentation, depth, speed, um, and lure manipulation uh, for, for triggering. If you don't fish jigs, you ought to. <laughs> First, we need to match the line diameter to the lure. Uh, the active factors here are the lure's density, um, its weight, and its uh, buoyancy or resi resistance to the water. These counteract the negative effects water has on the line. So, uh, as an example, say a buddy's um, just been killing him on an eighth ounce jig, and you can't get a bite. Uh, the first question that should go right along with the what lure question, and what are you using, um, is what diameter line he's using. Match his and you are in the ballpark, or, or at least in the ballgame, suddenly achieving the same potential to match his depth and speed. It's a darn good start. It's a huge start. Uh, he may just be fishing a foot deeper or, or shallower, um, a tad faster or slower, achieving better action or detecting takes better than you were, uh, and, and line can account for uh, a huge chunk of this. Often it's thinner line diameters that offer uh, a few more advantages. Um, thinner lines more easily slice the water column, giving us more direct control, uh, more precision in manipulating the lure's action and in detecting takes. Uh, the actions at the lure, both manipulations by you and bites from the fish, are more directly telegraphed to your rod simply because thinner lines uh, cut through water better. However, one can achieve similar depth and speed by matching the lure weight to the line diameter you're using. Uh, I've found over time that, that I could achieve similar depth and speed with, say, either a 1 16th ounce jig on 4 pound line or with a going up to a 3 32nd ounce jig when I'm using 6 pound line. Uh, the same depth and speed are also likely to be achieved with a 1 8th ounce jig uh, if you're uh, spooled up with eight pound line. Catch results are likely to be favorable with all three setups. Um, although as you go up in line diameter, the other factors we listed earlier um, can rear up and uh, possibly begin chipping away at, at, your, at your bite rate. Of course, you don't want to go to too light a line um, for a given lure weight. I often find and retrieve lures I find hung in trees that have too light a line hanging off of them. You want to have a chance at retrieving hung lures. Uh, and many an angler has snapped off a lure on the cast. <laughs> if that happens to you, go up in line diameter for that lure size. Uh, lastly, match your line diameter um, or, or break strength with your hook, uh, specifically the hook's wire diameter. If you find you're not getting the hooks into your fish or, or uh, fish are coming unpinned prematurely, make sure your line and hook wire thickness are well matched. Um, and check your hook point regularly and carry a hook on. <laughs> Uh, for reference, I'll offer um, a, th this table here uh, for matching lines with common hook gap sizes um, using standard wire. That's a standard wire hook. Um, hooks also come in light and heavy wire gauges for each gap size, so you'll want to adjust accordingly. Okay, 
That's some of the background behind why fishing lines can be so critical in getting fish to bite or, or not. Our next tackle know-how piece will break down the major types of fishing lines, uh, the properties manufacturers can build into their different line formulas, uh, and, and then we'll look at the marketing speak that manufacturers use to describe their offerings and at the same time uh, catch your attention. A great line doesn't do any of us any good if we don't ever hear about it. All right, get out there and get some fishing in, um, and I'll, I'll catch you, catch you folks next time.